Chapter seventy two of the Old Curiosity Shop. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Chapter seventy two. When the morning came, and they could speak more calmly on the subject of their grief, they heard how her life had closed. She had been dead two days. They were all about her at the time, knowing that the end was drawing on. She died soon after daybreak. They had read and talked to her in the earlier portion of the night, but as the hours crept on, she sunk to sleep. They could tell, by what she faintly uttered in her dreams, that they were of her journeyings with the old man. They were of no painful scenes, but of people who had helped and used them kindly, for she often said, God bless you with great fervour. Waking she never wandered in her mind but once, and that was a beautiful music which she said was in the air. God knows, it may have been. Opening her eyes at last from a very quiet sleep, she begged that they would kiss her once again. That done, she turned to the old man with a lovely smile upon her face, such, they said, as they had never seen, and never could forget and clung with both her arms about his neck. They did not know that she was dead, at first. She had spoken very often of the two sisters, who, she said, were like dear friends to her. She wished they could be told how much she thought about them, and how she had watched them as they walked together by the river side at night. She would like to see poor Kit, she had often said of late. She wished there was somebody to take her love to Kit, and, even then, she never thought or spoke about him, but with something of her old, clear, merry laugh. For the rest, she had never murmured or complained, but with a quiet mind and manner quite unaltered, save that she every day became more earnest and more grateful to them, faded like the light upon a summer's evening. The child, who had been her little friend, came there almost as soon as it was day, with an offering of dried flowers, which he begged them to lay upon her breast. It was he who had come to the window overnight, and spoken to the sexton, and they saw in the snow-traces of small feet where he had been lingering near the room in which she lay, before he went to bed. He had a fancy, it seemed, that they had left her there alone, and could not bear the thought. He told them of his dream again, and that it was of her being restored to them, just as she used to be. He begged hard to see her, saying that he would be very quiet, and that they need not fear his being alarmed, for he had sat alone by his young brother all day long when he was dead, and had felt glad to be so near him. They let him have his wish, and indeed he kept his word, and was, in his childish way, a lesson to them all. Up to that time the old man had not spoken once, except to her, or stirred from the bedside. But when he saw her little favourite, he was moved, as they had not seen him yet, and made as though he would have him come nearer. Then, pointing to the bed, he burst into tears for the first time, and they who stood by, knowing that the sight of this child had done him good, left them alone together. Soothing him with his artless talk of her, the child persuaded him to take some rest, to walk abroad, to do almost as he desired him and when the day came on, which must remove her in her earthly shape from earthly eyes for ever, he led him away, that he might not know when she was taken from him. They were to gather fresh leaves and berries for her bed. It was Sunday, a bright, clear, wintry afternoon, and as they traversed the village street, those who were walking in their path drew back to make way for them, and gave them a softened greeting. Some shook the old man kindly by the hand, some stood uncovered while he tottered by, and many cried, God help him, as he passed along. Neighbour, said the old man, stopping at the cottage where his young guide's mother dwelt, how is it that the folks are nearly all in black to-day? I have seen a morning ribbon or a piece of crape on almost every one. She could not tell, the woman said. Why? "'You yourself, you wear the colour, too,' he said, 
windows are closed that never used to be by day. What does this mean?' Again the woman said she could not tell. "'We must go back.' said the old man hurriedly. "'We must see what this is.' "'No, no,' cried the child, detaining him. "'Remember what you promised. Our way is, is, is to the old green lane, where she and I so often were, and where you found us more than once, making those garlands for a garden. Do not turn back.' "'Where is she now?' said the old man. "'Tell me that.' "'Do you not know?' returned the child. "'Did we not leave her but just now?' "'True, true. It was her we left, was it?' He pressed his hand upon his brow, looked vacantly round, and, as if impelled by a sudden thought, crossed the road and entered the sexton's house. He and his deaf assistant were sitting before the fire. Both rose up on seeing who it was. The child made a hasty sign to them with his hand. It was the action of an instant, but that and the old man's look were quite enough. "'Do you, do you bury any one to-day?' he said eagerly. "'No, no. Who should we bury, sir?' returned the sexton. "'I, who indeed, I say with you, who indeed?' "'It is a holiday with us, good sir,' returned the sexton mildly. "'We have no work to do to-day.' "'Why, then, I'll go where you will,' said the old man, turning to the child. "'You're sure of what you tell me. You would not deceive me. I am changed, even in the little time since you last saw me.' "'Go thy ways with him, sir.' cried the sexton, and heaven be with ye both. "'I am quite ready,' said the old man meekly. "'Come, boy, come,' and so submitted to be led away. And now the bell, the bell she had so often heard, by night and day, and listened to with solemn pleasure, almost as a living voice, rung its remorseless toll for her, so young, so beautiful, so good, Decrepit age, and vigorous life, and blooming youth, and helpless infancy, poured forth, on crutches, in the pride of strength and health, in the full blush of promise, in the mere dawn of life, to gather round her tomb. Old men were there, whose eyes were dim and senses failing, grandmothers who might have died ten years ago, and still been old, the deaf, the blind, the lame, the palsied, the living dead in many shapes and forms, to see the closing of that early grave. What was the death it would shut in, to that which still could crawl and creep above it? Along the crowded path they bore her now, pure as the newly fallen snow that covered it, whose day on earth had been as fleeting. Under the porch, where she had sat when heaven in its mercy brought her to that peaceful spot, she passed again and the old church received her in its quiet shade. They carried her to one old nook, where she had many and many a time sat musing, and laid their burden softly on the pavement. The light streamed on it through the coloured window, a window where the boughs of trees were ever rustling in the summer, and where the birds sang sweetly all day long. With every breath of air that stirred among those branches in the sunshine, some trembling, changing light, would fall upon her grave. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Many a young hand dropped in its little wreath. Many a stifled sob was heard. Some, and they were not a few, knelt down. All were sincere and truthful in their sorrow. The service done, the mourners stood apart, and the villagers closed round to look into the grave before the pavement stone should be replaced. One called to mind how he had seen her sitting on that very spot, and how her book had fallen on her lap, and she was gazing with a pensive face upon the sky. Another told how he had wondered much that one so delicate as she should be so bold, how she had never feared to enter the church alone at night, 
but had loved to linger there when all was quiet, and even to climb the tower stair was no more light than that of the moon rays stealing through the loopholes in the thick old wall. A whisper went about among the oldest, that she had seen and talked with angels, and when they called to mind how she had looked and spoken, and her early death, some thought it might be so, indeed. Thus, coming to the grave in little knots, and glancing down, and giving place to others, and falling off in whispering groups of three or four, the church was cleared in time, of all but the sexton and the mourning friends. They saw the vault covered, and the stone fixed down. Then, when the dusk of evening had come on, and not a sound disturbed the sacred stillness of the place, when the bright moon poured in her light on tomb and monument, on pillar, wall, and arch, and most of all, it seemed to them, upon her quiet grave. In that calm time, when outward things and inward thoughts teem with assurances of immortality, and worldly hopes and fears are humbled in the dust before them, then, with tranquil and submissive hearts, they turned away, and left the child with God. Oh! It is hard to take to heart the lesson that such deaths will teach. But let no man reject it, for it is one that all must learn, and is a mighty universal truth. When death strikes down the innocent and young, for every fragile form from which he lets the panting spirit free, a hundred virtues rise, in shapes of mercy, charity, and love, to walk the world and bless it. Of every tear that sorrowing mortals shed on such green graves, some good is born, some gentler nature comes. In the destroyer's steps there spring up bright creations that defy his power, and his dark path becomes a way of light to heaven. It was late when the old man came home. The boy had led him to his own dwelling, under some pretense on their way back, and, rendered drowsy by his long ramble and late want of rest, he had sunk into a deep sleep by the fireside. He was perfectly exhausted, and they were careful not to rouse him. The slumber held him a long time, and when he at length awoke, the moon was shining. The younger brother, uneasy at his protracted absence, was watching at the door for his coming, when he appeared in the pathway with his little guide. He advanced to meet them, and tenderly obliging the old man to lean upon his arm, conducted him with slow and trembling steps towards the house. He repaired to her chamber straight. Not finding what he had left there, he returned with distracted looks to the room in which they were assembled. From that he rushed into the schoolmaster's cottage, calling her name. They followed close upon him, and when he had vainly searched it, brought him home. With such persuasive words as pity and affection could suggest, they prevailed upon him to sit among them, and hear what they should tell him. Then, endeavouring by every little artifice to prepare his mind for what must come, and dwelling with many fervent words upon the happy lot to which she had been removed, they told him at last the truth. The moment it had passed their lips, he fell down among them like a murdered man. For many hours they had little hope of his surviving, but grief is strong, and he recovered. If there be any who have never known the blank that follows death, the weary void, the sense of desolation that will come upon the strongest minds, when something familiar and beloved is missed at every turn, the connection between inanimate and senseless things, and the object of recollection, when every household god becomes a monument, and every room a grave. If there be any who have not known this, and proved it by their own experience, they can never faintly guess how, for many days, the old man pined and moped away the time, and wandered here and there as seeking something, and had no comfort. Whatever power of thought or memory he retained, was all bound up in her. He never understood, or seemed to care to understand, about his brother. To every endearment and attention he continued listless. If they spoke to him on this, or any other theme, save one, he would hear them patiently for a while, then turn away, and go on seeking as before. On that one theme, which was in his and all their minds, it was impossible to touch. Dead. He could not hear or 
bear the word. The slightest hint of it would throw him into a paroxysm, like that he had when it was first spoken. In what hope he lived, no man could tell, but that he had some hope of finding her again, some faint and shadowy hope, deferred from day to day, and making him from day to day more sick and sore at heart, was plain to all. They bethought them of a removal from the scene of this last sorrow, of trying whether change of place would rouse or cheer him. His brother sought the advice of those who were accounted skilful in such matters, and they came and saw him. Some of the number stayed upon the spot, conversed with him when he would converse, and watched him as he wandered up and down, alone and silent. Move him where they might, they said, he would ever seek to get back there. His mind would run upon that spot. If they confined him closely, and kept a strict guard upon him, they might hold him prisoner, but if he could by any means escape, he would surely wander back to that place, or die upon the road. The boy, to whom he had submitted at first, had no longer any influence with him. At times he would suffer the child to walk by his side, or would even take such notice of his presence as giving him his hand, or would stop to kiss his cheek, or pat him on the head. At other times he would entreat him, not unkindly, to be gone, and would not brook him near. But, whether alone, or with this pliant friend, or with those who would have given him, at any cost or sacrifice, some consolation or some peace of mind, if happily the means could have been devised, he was at all times the same, with no love or care for anything in life, a broken-hearted man. At length they found one day that he had risen early, and, with his knapsack on his back, his staff in hand, her own straw hat, and little basket full of such things as she had been used to carry, was gone. As they were making ready to pursue him far and wide, a frightened schoolboy came who had seen him, but a moment before, sitting in the church, upon her grave, he said. They hastened there, and going softly to the door, espied him in the attitude of one who waited patiently. They did not disturb him then, but kept a watch upon him all that day. When it grew quite dark, he rose and returned home, and went to bed, murmuring to himself, "'She will come to-morrow.' Upon the morrow he was there again, from sunrise until night, and still at night he laid him down to rest, and murmured, "'She will come to-morrow.' And thenceforth, every day, and all day long, he waited at her grave for her. How many pictures of new journeys over pleasant country, of resting places under the free broad sky, of rambles in the fields and woods and paths not often trodden, how many tones of that one well-remembered voice, how many glimpses of the form, the fluttering dress, the hair that waved so gaily in the wind, how many visions of what had been and what he hoped was yet to be, rose up before him in the old, dull, silent church. He never told them what he thought, or where he went. He would sit with them at night, pondering with a secret satisfaction they could see, upon the flight that he and she would take before night came again. And still they would hear him whisper in his prayers, Lord, let her come to-morrow. The last time was on a genial day in spring. He did not return at the usual hour, and they went to seek him. He was lying dead upon the stone. They laid him by the side of her whom he had loved so well, and, in the church where they had often prayed, and mused, and lingered hand in hand, the child and the old man slept together. End of chapter 72